Hey guys, what's going on? It's Dan Geesing. Thank you so much for tuning in to episode 22 of the Dan Geesing Podcast. I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day to dial in, whether you're working out, walking, commuting, in school, should be listening to your teacher, but get, you got your AirPods in, earbuds, whatever. Thank you guys so much. Today's episode, we're doing something a little bit different. We're going to go straight q and I, you know, I always like to change things up, keep it fresh. And so last week, I put a tweet out, said, hey, if you have any questions, let me know. Just put one out right now. So we got two threads plus a little Instagram action. And uh, so if you're watching this on YouTube, because I do post the, the podcast videos on YouTube, you'll get a chance to look at my feed directly, the questions. So we're just going to go through them and, and, and knock them out. And uh, But I'm super excited. It's been a great week. Had some great shows. Things are, things are moving forward. Just being patient and, and continuing to build brick by brick. But with that being said, I want to jump right in to these questions. And I'm going to do my best to answer as many as humanly possible in uh, in the allotted time. And what is the allotted time? I don't know. You know we like to keep things roughly between you know, 30, 45 minutes per episode. All right. So here we go. First question is from Trevor Farley on Twitter. And Trevor says, early on, what things helped keep you consistent when uploading on YouTube? Two episodes a day as well as consistent with the Twitch schedule. Thanks in advance for your answer. Love the podcast. Well, Trevor, I think the number one thing, you know, if you're asking where to start, start with something manageable, right? So for me, I just sometimes, and this this is one of my holes in the armor, if you will. Sometimes my, my eyes are bigger than my, my stomach. And I want to do everything all at once. And, and I think the thing is is to just develop a schedule and say, hey, I'm going to do one video Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, no matter what. So I, if you got to stay up till 3 a.m. because you work late or whatever, whatever it takes, you know, if you can't get three videos done per week based on your schedule, maybe two week, two videos per week, maybe one video. But whatever it is, set it and stick to it because I'm a really big believer in setting a schedule and I am in, in, in no way, shape, or form the expert or infallible on this, but you know, because I <clears throat> there's times when I'm like, okay, hey, expect this video every single day at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, and and the series will tail off and things like that. But I think it's so important because when I started approaching everything or really starting to look at everything as almost like a television station, that's when it it kind of clicked for me in, in terms of both Twitch and YouTube, where it's People tune in to, say, NBC or CBS, and they know every single ABC Tuesdays at 8 o'clock, This Is Us is going to be on. You know, now there's a lot of different options to watch. You can watch it after the fact in VOD format, but there's people that like to watch things as they come out. And if, if you say This Is Us or the Dan Keesting Show is going to be live Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and it doesn't start till 3, doesn't start at all, or starts at 10 a.m., you know, it's just not how it works in terms of if you're looking to build something, you need to be dependable and consistent. And so I think to start Trevor, just, just take a honest self audit, look at your time. What can you physically do every single week? And then start, start small, take, take a little bite. And there's a, there's a little metaphor I love using cause it's true. It's like, imagine you're, you're trapped in a jail cell, but instead of concrete, it's made entirely out of cake. 20 foot walls. How are you going to get out of that jail cell? Not all at once. You're going to get out one bite at a time. And I feel that's the best way to attack anything, whether it's YouTube or Twitch. Start small. Start small. And if you can knock out one video a week, you know, easy, increase it to two and then kind of build from there. But you don't want to start two videos a day, every single day, and then you get three days into it, burn out, and all of a sudden you're kind of back at square one. So it's a slow process and you build from there. So I hope that helps, Trevor. Next question. This is a pretty deep one from Hey Look A Whale on Twitter. And Hey Look A Whale on Twitter says, What's the biggest thing that holds people back from success? Further, what do you think is holding you back from reaching new heights? And I feel like I, I'm not in a position to to comment on other people, right? Because I feel that unless you know someone directly and you know their situation, what's going on, you know, everyone's got a different story and everyone has a story and what works for one person may not even be in the realm of possibility for another based on their situation, environment, things of that nature. So the only thing I can really comment on is what do I think is holding me back from reaching new heights. And I, and I feel like I would say holding me back, but something I'm definitely focused on is just being patient, right? Is that looking at everything, taking a step back and knowing that things don't happen overnight. 
And as long as you, you put your head down, you continue to work. And biggest thing, staying persistent, not giving up. I feel like that's a big thing. But it, you know, I think maybe on a meta level, I guess the, the way I'll answer is that people need to work for a longer period of time and be patient, right? You know, it may take you two years, may take you five years, may take you seven years. But if you're willing to not bend the knee and, and fold your cards, uh, I think really anything is possible as long as you're self-aware. And then when I say that, I mean, know that, you know, I know that I'm never going to be an NBA basketball player. You know, it's just I'm self-aware enough to know that's not going to happen. You know, so there's we all have certain limitations, but for the most part, I feel that you can accomplish anything depending on how long you're willing to work for it. All right, next question. This is from Coach Hayes ES on Twitter. It says, any advice for first year teachers? And for people that don't know, I'm a former high school teacher and I taught for maybe four or five years and enjoyed my time there. I feel like it should almost be a prerequisite for a lot of things, you know, future jobs and, and, you know, business owners, anything, because it's such a, you have to wear so many different hats, but I think most importantly, you have to be prepared in front of an audience every single day. And two, you have to learn how to speak in front of a group of people. And until you do it, you're not going to get good at it. I think it's very rare that someone can talk in front of a group of people without having some practice and, and what better way to have practice every single day in front of a tough audience as, as kids, you know, if you're not on point, you're going to get called out in, in, in a different way. You know, you, you got to know what you're talking about. You have to be able to deliver it and relate to a lot of different people. And I feel like as a teacher, if you can teach someone, you can teach anyone. Right. And I, I think some teachers may flex a little bit on, on being prideful on, making things as complicated as possible. But I feel like the best teachers are able to simplify anything, the most complicated things down to what I like to call first grade instructions. But my advice to you as a first year teacher, number one, know that you're not their friend and don't try to be their friends. And, and, I, and I say this from a point of, of course, you want their adulation and respect, but that's earned. It's not something you're going to do by being buddy, buddy with them, you know, it just doesn't happen like that. What what has to happen, and I, and I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek, but essentially no smiling in the first semester, more or less, you know, depending on your situation. I, I, I kind of mean that in a sarcastic way, but also kind of serious. But I think most importantly, the thing to keep in mind is that they really – they don't uh, – this is kind of a football saying too, but, but I hope this helps you, is that your students – don't care what you know until they know how much you care about them. And there's a lot of different things you can do to show that you care about them. You get to know them on an individual level, you know, uh, as much as you can. Know their situation, know their brothers and sisters, know what they like, know what they don't like, know what they're into, know what they're good at in the class, what they're not good at. If if a kid uh, struggles reading in front of the group, maybe you don't put them on blast every single opportunity. Maybe you help them out, you know. So just a lot of different situations. But Bottom line, if the kids know you care about them, you're going to be fine, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, a lot of people get into teaching for a lot of different reasons, but if you want to be a successful teacher, that's, uh, that, that's my best advice really. And, and if you're in the front of a group about anything, right. So whether, you know, you're, you're managing a, a group of people in business or you're an HR manager or running a store and you have employees, that's the biggest thing, man. As long as people know you care about them, you're going to be all right. And I think a lot of people don't care about the people that they work with or work for or have work with them and that's a tough thing but anyways that's my first that's my best advice for you as a first year teacher what's my favorite sports moment uh this is from it's underscore br1an on twitter i'd say one of my favorite moments if i have to look back on it there's two that stick out in my head and, and both are completely unrelated but i remember being in high school and, you know, at a little Super Bowl party, it was nothing fancy. But I remember watching, and this is just seared in my memory, watching the Super Bowl between the St. Louis Rams and the Tennessee Titans. And it was such a great game. And it came down, I can still see it, man. I can still see it on one of those big CRT TVs that, uh, I don't know, it was Isaac Bruce or whoever the wide receiver was. He gets tackled like one yard short and his arms extended trying to score the touchdown. And that's how the Super Bowl ended. That's, I think it's the best Super Bowl I'd ever seen. So that sticks out. And then also I was fortunate enough it, in somewhere in college, the Pistons had made the NBA finals. And I, I told the story, I've told the story once on 
stream before, but it was me and my buddy Phil. We were in college, and the way they did tickets to the NBA Finals back then is you would have to log onto a computer, and it was kind of like a crapshoot lottery. So we, I remember him and I, we went to the college computer lab, the business co uh, computer lab. We, we log into computers. I think we each had maybe two computers up, and this is before the days of you know, Yeezy sniping and all that stuff. And I think I got through and I, and he got through, or I think I just got through and got a pair of tickets and I had the option. You have to pick a game, right? So I think we had options games four and five and they were playing the Lakers. And for whatever reason I had it on game four and I'm like, mm, let's just pick game five. You know, let's just pick game five, pick game five, I bought eight tickets, maybe six tickets, eight, or, six or eight tickets. And at the time, you know, I'm kind of hedging my bets here on this using a credit card and that my buddies are going to pay me to go, you know, but we got NBA finals tickets for the Pistons, which is incredible. A chance to see your home team, one of your favorite hometown teams win a championship. So it ends up working out that heading into game five, the Pistons were up three to one and you know, I got well, as soon as word got out that I had got some tickets and, you know, they had lost one of the first four games. It's like, holy cow, game five could be the NBA championship. And so, you know, people start texting me, said, hey, you want to sell the tickets? You want to sell the tickets? I'm like, no, you know, I played paid face value. I don't remember what they were, maybe 80 or 100 bucks or something like that. I mean, it's NBA finals. So we end up going to the game and they end up winning the NBA finals at that game. And it's just one of those things where it's like could kind of cross that off the list. It's super rare. Like I would never individually now even I would never say that happened and I could buy NBA finals tickets I'm, I would never pay above retail value I wouldn't pay $500 to sit in the nosebleeds to see the Pistons maybe win a championship I just wouldn't do that you know so to be able to do that in college really with no money and kind of pull it off was was fun and it just just a memory you win you, you'll have because it's just a, such a rare opportunity so I'd say those are my two favorite sports moments I'm not sure if that that's what you meant or not. All right, next question is from Cypher Pursuit on Twitter. It says, what made you motivated to pursue a career in YouTube and what keeps you motivated from this day? By the way, big fan, much love from, from Canada. Yo, love back out to Canada as well. I, any time I spent in Canada has always been so much fun. Everyone's so nice. But what motivated, what motivated me to pursue a career in YouTube and what continues to motivate me? So I started out, on Twitch, and I talked this about this in podcast episode one. So if you guys want the real like nitty gritty detail story, I listen to episode one of the podcast. I talk about how it's kind of just a, a chance meeting on Twitter and, and how everything lined up with DJ Wheat. But I started doing YouTube videos just to try and do something different, right? Because I started streaming on Twitch and I didn't really know the whole thing. And I didn't, it wasn't like I wanted to pursue a career in YouTube. I, it's more of like, hey, let me try this thing, see if I like it, because I like streaming, and then just see what happens from there, and just kind of grow, you know, I would say snowballed, but but year on year end, it just started to grow a little bit and little bit and little bit, so I didn't go in with uh, the idea to say, hey, this is what I'm going to do full time, because it's still not what I do full time, it's definitely grown a lot, but I think it was just something I tried out and enjoyed doing, and then enjoyed, I really enjoy kind of the feedback loop of being able to create something that may distract someone or entertain someone and have people be invested into a game or series as much as I am. And I, you know, I enjoy getting involved in the community, getting people's tips and tricks, what they like to see, what they don't like to see. So it was just really something as a kid, you know, I talked about it maybe in a future uh, past podcast episode that I initially wanted to major in broadcasting and then I'm like, uh, for whatever reason, I, I stood down from that. I don't, I can't tell you why, but I initially that's what I wanted to major in in college. And I felt like that was always kind of like a bug in my system, something that I didn't, I knew I wanted to do. I didn't know how to go about doing it. And back when I was in college, this wasn't, you know, this wasn't even a thing. And so I, I think that's part of it. I just think there's people have innate things that they want to do or know they want to do. And for some people, it's very clear. And some people kind of got to got to find their way and, and figure it out. So for me, it was just something that was kind of intuitive or, or something, I guess, in my DNA that I wanted to do. And uh, in terms of 
what pursues me to, to stay motivated. It's just something I really enjoy and I don't want to see it a go away and B stay stagnant. So really, and that's not how I view it. I view it more on the, the positive side in terms of I enjoy it and I want to continue to grow it. And to me, it's a challenge. What can I continue to do to push growth on the channel? And, and so that's what I think what pushes me not to mention, you know, the community, which is a whole separate thing. All right. Next question from is it's zomb it's underscore zombie on Twitter. What's the rate of consumption when you quaff liquids so vigorously? I don't know what the word quaff means. I can only assume based on the context around the question that you're talking about, like drinking things really fast. So I don't know. It started out some, as something goofy I did on Twitch and just kind of became a thing. And if, if you ever watch the show, you know what I'm talking about. But can you get an ounce per second? I would probably say minimum six ounces per half second. All right, next question is from Justin. When you lost your wife in Mario, the Woodwick Justin on Twitter said, when you lost your wife in Mario Party, did you let her win? So I would never really played Mario Party super in depth. And I played it last week and tweeted about it with my wife. And it's a huge RNG fest. Like I'm, I love playing board games because there's, you can always mitigate some RNG with strategy. And I thought I was doing that in Mario party, but it's super RNG heavy to the point where she was in last p place in the second to last turn and she ended up winning. So it's kind of like super RNG, but no, I, I, I never let anyone win. I always play really hard because what's the point? If you're going to play something, you play to win the game. <laughs> so next question is from Rico Lico. On Twitter says, "Hey Dan, been loving the NCAA Bowl series. Have you started about? Have you thought about doing an offensive coordinator or head coaching series in the game in the NCAA? I think you'd have a lot of fun with it." So Rico Lico, I always read comments and tweets like this because when you start, when you do what I do on this side of things, when you start to hear the same thing over and over again, it's like, hey, people want to see this, and that's a good thing because it. It just means that if there's an outcry or if there are a lot of people are talking about something, they want to see you do it. And, and there's a lot of people like Julian said, hey, Dan, I think you should do a dynasty. You should do a dynasty. So we're doing a dynasty right now on YouTube. And it's so bizarre to me a little bit because I'm playing a game that came out in 2013 on an old console and it's doing well on the channel. And this is one of those things where for me, I, you know, it was a total crapshoot. I. I think the underlying factor is I love the game. It's it's one of the games I played the most, you know, the series I played the most, you know, I'd say ever. You know, I just played a lot of college football, especially through college and, and even in high school because I just really love the game. And with my football background, I just, I don't know, maybe I understated that, but I've learned so much throughout the series in terms of what I take for granted and that people enjoy learning football stuff, terminology, strategy from the series. So it's been a lot of fun. And I really look forward to shooting that series every single day. Next question is from Tyler Bedford on Twitter says, what's my favorite color? Definitely red. Uh, Jennifer Laney on Twitter says, favorite 2018 movie? I would have to go, let me pull my IMDb because I'm one of the things I love doing. And I, I started out doing it just for like a personal record of knowing what movies I've seen, which I haven't because there's a time when you're like, you watch a movie, you're like, have I seen this before? And you don't remember. I, at least I do. I don't, maybe because of, I have the memory of a young squirrel. However, so what I started doing is, this is maybe eight years ago, I started rating movies on IMDb, and it keeps a log of all the movies that I've seen and also the ratings. So in terms of 2018, my the favorite movie that I saw, I'm pretty sure it came out in 2018, so I want to double check it. Definitely my favorite series that I watched in 2018 was Cobra Kai. It was on YouTube Red. It was extremely well done. I'd highly recommend that, especially if you are into Karate Kid. So I, this movie came out in 2017. It's my favorite movie of that year. It was Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. So that was the, my favorite movie of 2017. 2018, here's what I've seen. I'll just, I'll just give you guys the notables. I saw a Game Night. I was okay, 7 out of 10. Mission Impossible, I gave that a 4 out of 10. Yikes. Um, I don't really see any t any great movies I saw in 2018. I like Homecoming, the series, on Amazon Prime. Recommend that. I like stuff that's a little bit off and a little bit weird. I don't like, personally, I'm not a big superhero movie guy. I like watching something where you kind of got to figure out what's going on, figure out what the message is, and it's not like just not just shown to you, right? You got to do some thinking yourself. So I would say the 
my favorite movie I saw in 2018. It's an old movie, but I'd never seen it before. It's called came out in 1982. It's called An Officer and a Gentleman, starring Richard Gere. I gave it a 10 out of 10. So I would go see that, but it didn't come out in 2018. <laughs> um. Nick, LOL, have ever got lost in the sauce? I, I think I would need to look that up on Urban Dictionary. Uh, but I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no off the bat on that one. Next question is from ASAP Mark Ferg. What's it like being better than Northern Lion? So, I, you know, I'm not going to answer that question for obvious reasons. But I will say I'm super, super fired up. Well, we're gonna. There's a unity question coming up later, but he's just a nice guy, man. I, I think he's uh, brings a lot of joy to a lot of people. I think he's super witty, super smart, and uh, extremely hard work, which is a great combination to have. And and it's cool, but you know, I, I just I look at him and and you know, I like that. I just think he's always dialed in, and he's always he's always smart about what he does. And I really appreciate that. And I think that's, that's underplayed a little bit. All right. So next question is from Tristan on Twitter. So what was my favorite place to study at MSU? Probably I would say the main library, I guess. I, I didn't really like studying though. Are you kind of something you had to force yourself to do? All right, next question is from Darian Maxwell on Twitter. He said, where did the whole red shirt, gold chain thing start and come from? So the red shirt thing came from, I'll give you guys a little inside scoop on that, was when I was on Big Brother, I brought a couple shirts with me, no big deal. And then there was this challenge that we did in which there were these voodoo dolls, and they were each made in someone's likeness. And I noticed mine was wearing a red shirt. And I'm like, I wonder if that's how they're kind of branding me on the show. Because the more familiar you can get with the audience and th the more they make you look the same, the more easily relatable you are, et cetera, et cetera. So it was that moment. I remember seeing that thinking from this moment on, I'm not going to wear a different shirt on the show. I just started wearing red every single day. And that kind of became, became part of it. You know, so I'd say back, this was back in 20, 2008. And I like the color red. It's my favorite color. And so just that kind of became a thing. And then the gold chain thing, I've always, you know, I, my grandparents gave me a gold chain when I was I don't know middle school high school and so it's something I've always worn so it's not something that really became a thing I think it's just something that became more apparent and I guess a way to identify and separate from other things so that's kind of I guess the origin story of that stuff all right next question is from Scott Love 1264 on Twitter says, what is the most resinous thing in all of video gaming? So resin, in case you guys have no, no idea what it is, it's an inside joke that came from our playthrough of Dark Souls Remastered where we were fighting these gargoyle bosses and chat was saying, hey, Dan, just put the gold pine resin on your weapon and you'll kill them, you know, in three or four hits, whatever. I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. And so be, and the reason I don't want to do that, it's like easy mode, right? So anything that's that's makes the game super easy or you could you know I don't, borderline cheat is resin blue deck and magic the gathering is resin what's the most resinous thing in all of video gaming i would say probably wall hacking i think wall hacking in multiplayer games or hacking any multiplayer game is probably the the, the highest form of resin <laughs> the purple platypus says what's my favorite rest favorite fast food restaurant sells your favorite nuggets i'm really you know i'm a multi-restaurant nugget lover i i don't think i've ever had a bad nugget you know i just I, i'm kind of like a kid in that in that arena like if i have a choice you know i like a good steak and, and things of that nature but if i got a choice between a steak and like great chicken fingers or nuggets it's a, it's a coin flip and i mean that like i i'm a severe lover of chicken fingers the best kind are are the ones that are super flat and wide i mean second to none so I, and if i had to pick one fast food i would probably say chick-fil-a has good i don't know if they call them like chunks they're really good and but every day i think w wendy's are solid you know I, I like i said i don't think you can get a bad chicken nugget uh next question is from peru pair to set g Pair to sit G says, how do you maintain a happy attitude every day, all day? So I think 
what's important to note is that it's not like that all the time, right? You're going to, there's times when, you know, things go wrong and yet you, you say you have a bad day, but I just try to keep everything in perspective as much as possible. I'm someone who's not extremely patient. So that's something I definitely work on. But in terms of maintaining a happy attitude, I just feel extremely grateful and fortunate for everything that I have the opportunity to do. And so when you're looking at things from a perspective of feeling grateful and fortunate, all of a sudden the things that may not go so well aren't really that big of a deal because I don't know. I just, I look at what's around me and I, I'm, I feel fortunate for what I have and what I don't have. And I think a big thing about that is I don't compare what I have to anything to anyone else or, and I don't, you know, I don't really look for approval from people in my circle or family, meaning I don't really care what anyone thinks really to a 99.9% .9 degree of certainty. Meaning, you know, I, I care what my wife thinks about things that I do, but it's not gonna, in terms of from a family standpoint, but in terms of things that I do that make me happy in terms of YouTube and Twitch and, and everything I do, but when I start, stopped caring about what other people thought, that's when things really took off. And so I think because I can do that, and it's not easy, I think it takes a long time to get to that point. But I think since I've been able to get to that point, I've been a lot happier. You know, I don't care. I don't do something and think, oh, I wonder what this person is going to think about it. You know, and I think at some point I definitely did. Uh, but once I got to that point when I truly didn't care and you can get to a point when you truly don't care if you're doing what you want to do, regardless of any outside pressure, then I, I think it, it gets a lot easier. So I hope that helps you out. Next question is from Blue Aside Park on Twitter it says, where do you see the channel slash brand in five years? What do you hope for in the future? You know, my hope for in the future is this is just continuing to grow and continuing to to grind away i enjoy the process of what i do right so you know especially on twitch you know there's been we've hit some big milestones we've dipped to those milestones but that's not really what i focus on you know i have it as a goal of course but you know if subs fluctuate or anything like that i don't really look at that because i enjoy the process right so i start i enjoy the show i enjoy making videos on youtube and all the stuff i think that comes along with that I think is all like a secondary benefit, right? So it, it, if you do what you're supposed to do, all that stuff will follow it. I don't, I don't think it leads, right? So I don't, th I don't lead with saying, oh, how can I, you know, make the highest amount of money from Twitch today or YouTube today? That, that's not how I approach it. I try to approach it from, hey, what does the community want to see? What can I do to provide the com community entertainment, distraction, having a good time, connecting with each other that's how I approach it and I feel like because that's how I approach it and I don't focus on the other things like what can I do to make this person's day better what can I do to give this person the show they want to see or the community the show they want to see what game can I does the community want to see me play that they're going to get the most enjoyment out of not what do I do to squeeze every dollar out you know so I, I that's the last thing that comes across my mind so because of that like I just I just focus on on making the show better every single day. And I, and I hope that five years from now, the show's way different than it is now from a quality standpoint. And just as I look back five years ago, I'd be like, holy cow, what was I doing? You know, but it's just a process of you, you, you do something once you're not very good at. It, you're probably pretty bad at it. You do something again, you get a little bit better. And by the time you've done it, <laughs> thousands of times you start to get the hang of it a little bit and find different ways you can you can get better at it and one of the things I do during the show is I, I have a, a little notepad next to me and there's little ideas that pop up during the show as a result of a situation that I'll write down really quick and saying hey next show I need to do this or I need to get this set up for next show because you know, you can't start with a list of a thousand things to do or get better, right? It, it takes time. And so for me, whether it's, you know, adding doom music into an escape from Tarkov run because that great idea came from the community or having a random live challenge in the middle of a playthrough of the messenger because it pops up from the community. And then I get an idea how I can push that one step further. Like that stuff when you're, when you're broadcasting or you're streaming on Twitch, if you don't write it down, you're probably going to forget it because you're doing so many things at once. And so for me, that's what I try to do. I just try to move the needle, the needle of making the show better, the community better, just 
half a millimeter each every single day and, and by the end of the time it's over the needles moved a heck of a lot more than than one millimeter so i hope that helps uh n- another question from rico lico says how do you balance playing a variety of games while still trying to retain a core audience now i think this is, i've talked a little bit about this in the past and i feel like i don't feel like i'm doing it as efficiently as possible meaning that i think the best way to grow is and especially I'd say in an expedited fashion is to focus on one thing and just laser it through, right? Like just do one thing, do it well, go as deep and wide as you can with it. So whether you're covering a game, you play the game, you do videos about different aspects of the game and you dial in. So for me, I don't do it entirely like that. And I don't think I will ever do that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I don't necessarily want to hitch myself onto one game and one game only because a lot of things can happen right so say the game fails they make a poor decision something bad happens all of a sudden you're in you're tied to this one game if that one game goes away you got problems and it's kind of a catch-22 because that's the best way in my opinion i think you can grow your audience is to become like a figure in that one specific game and become a resource or someone who provides value to the community in one game. So I wouldn't come out firing playing 1,800 different games. However, what I try to do is I try to balance the two. I try to have a main game and then a rotating second game. And, and I do that for two reasons. One, because I don't want to be hitched to one game. Two, because I like a lot of different games. And it also, when you play a second game, so the way the show is set up, you guys know I always play Escape from Tarkov, and then a single-player game where the, you know there's a beginning beginning middle and finite end and i do that because sometimes people want to watch the show but they don't want to watch tarkov it gives people something else to watch and also it gives me a chance to play other games outside of one game could i play escape from tarkov every single day every single show i could i enjoy the game that much however for those couple reasons i i don't and um you know i think from a growth standpoint it's not the best strategy, a short-term growth standpoint, it's not the best strategy, but for long-term, like I'm not doing this for short-term. I think what I'm doing long-term is going to work over time and, and it it has worked over time. So I'm super excited about it. And I I think dialing in the show, how I have, it it gives me kind of the best of both worlds. One, like I said, not the most efficient. It's what works for me. Uh, but if I were starting from square one right now, I would pick one main game for a while and kind of run that until you, you get going a little bit. All right, next question is from Will Wilkerson5 on Twitter and says, how have your past experiences, like being on Big Brother teaching and coaching, influenced the way you run your show? That's really interesting because I think just nailing those three aspects of my life or you know history, previous life, I could pull one thing from each of it. I I think from coaching, one of the big things I I take from coaching and bring to the show is that it's about a community, right? When you coach, it's not just about one-on-one players. It's about the team. It's about the people around it. It's about the coaching staff. It's about the support staff. It's about the families. And I feel like that's part of what I try to do with the show is it's not just a show. Like there's a community outside of it. It's extremely supportive of each other. That's why I'm very very tough on keeping things positive and clean because I feel like that propagates a a really positive community that's that helps each other you know some people may live in an area where they don't have a lot of friends or not a lot of support and and it's cool you know it's just I wanted to give people a place to go and hang out that was fun positive and even if they have friends in real life but a place they can go to get away from seeing stuff on the news or always, you know, getting hit with all this negative news on the internet. I just wanted people to have a place to go where they know no matter what, none of that's going to creep in the community because we're very, very diligent against having that happen. So I think I take that from coaching, from teaching. I think being able to explain things, but more importantly, one of the things on a micro level during the show, what I do is that I really want people to be involved in in the show in terms of helping, giving tips, guides, what I like to call front seating. I encourage that. And, you know, on a super granular micro level, one of the things that's come about is what I like to call giving first grade instructions. And that's, you know, I want people when they give tips to explain it like they would to a first grader. 
And I feel like that's highly, highly underrated is that a lot of people try to give these complex instructions where everything can, if you can boil complex things down very simply, makes life easier for everyone. And, and I think that's something on a, on a extremely micro level that's kind of come from teaching is that, you know, having people in the community understand what first grade instructions are and being able to translate what they're thinking, what they want to have happen on the show and actually get it done because they present it in a way that's on a first grade level. And I say it on a first grade level, you know, partly like, like to be kind of funny, but it's extremely important is that you know, when people are trying to give you instructions, you're always going to, the ones that are the clearest and most concise that a first grader can do are the ones you're going to do because it makes the most sense. And then I think for Big Brother, I, I just, I kind of felt like from Big Brother, what I bring to the show is that I've understood after being on camera, you know, on for two summers on a reality TV show, I kind of understand different ways to heighten different parts of my personality or how I project or inflect things or how to read what's working well or not. You know, having all that time on camera has really helped me translate more on Twitch. And, and I think it's, it's definitely a part of it, but I'd even say more of that is just the experience of being on Twitch for over five years. Like if you look at my first few streams, it's like, yo, resident sleeper. And then now, it's just come a long way because you learn and get better over time. So I hope hope that answers your question. That was a really interesting question. And he, he tacked on another one on that. Will said, specifically in what ways do you think you make your show more appealing than other streamers? I don't look at it as more appealing. I look at it as providing something different. And I feel like what we provide differently is that I'm extremely self-aware that, you know, I'm not great at games. I think I'm average to good. But I, I'm, I'm aware that people don't tune into the show to see – you know, world records being set or going 30 and 0 in a battle royale game or whatever. I think people tune in to be entertained, to be distracted, to be part of a community that's extremely positive and have a lot of fun. And I, I think people, when people watch the show for the first time, I think that's what they walk away with. They may laugh, you know, for, for what other people may try to hide being not good at a game. You know, I think people laugh because they see that we're having fun. And I, I think that's, that's super, super important. And then the last question on Twitter is from Michael M metal guinea pig on Twitter said, what's the largest honker, AKA fish you've ever caught fishing? I think I'm, you know, I may have caught like a, a five foot, six foot bass. Maybe. I mean, nothing crazy. You know, I've caught a few fish in my day. I enjoy going fishing every now and then, but I would say I'm, I'm not uh, an extremely experienced fisherman by any stretch of the imagination other thing i did is i put um i put out a deal on let's see if i can show you guys i put out a instagram live so i, I gave people on instagram a chance to fire in some hey, questions what's going on? i'm about this to what I put shoot out a special q a podcast so if there's any question you want answered feel free to dm or send me a message on here and i'll respond to them directly on monday's episode so if you guys are not following on Instagram, I've been one of my things in 2019. I'm, I set out to post at least one thing per day on Instagram. I haven't missed a day, and I think it's important. And so if you're not following at Instagram.com slash Dan Geesling, I'll post a lot of Twitch highlights there, some edited Twitch highlights, and also I provide a little some insight into my personal life and old pictures and things like that on there. So I, I got a bunch of questions here on Instagram live. I'm going to knock out a couple here. And this is a good one. This is from Tom Anderson, 87 on Instagram says, how during stagnation do you come up with new ideas that further advance your growth on a platform? That's a really great question. I think the big thing you guys know, the big thing I'm on is, is trying something brand new, completely different. I E here's an example of it doing nothing but a Q and a podcast and seeing how it goes. And so I think that's one way, just try something brand new. You know, Tarkov, I always talk about Tarkov was never supposed to be a main game on the channel. This is something I tried once, people liked. A lot of people watched it and kind of took it from there. It's Smash, same thing. I tried it one Friday. A lot of people watched, a lot of people liked it. And so just trying new things and, and not doing the same thing over and over and over and over again because really nothing's going to change in that fashion. And I think the other thing is, is that... Like I said, I, I gave that tip about I keep this pad next to me while I'm streaming and ideas will pop up and don't be afraid to try new stuff. So I think that's a big thing. And another thing would be reaching out to other people in the community to play with. 
or, or collaborate with, I think I think that's always a surefire win to to definitely spike at least some new thoughts, if not new growth on the channel. This is from Nick Bone on Twitter says, "Not my toughest question. What are your thoughts on Windsor, Ontario? Windsor, Ontario is just a stone's throw away from where I grew up, and I had some good times there. I think it's a great spot. All right, <laughs> Sean says." What did you learn from your experience as an org leader in Star Citizen? So back when we played a lot of Star Citizen, we have an organization. We still do. And I think the biggest thing I learned is that to be extremely aware of the community or setting some community standards. I, I feel like that's the biggest thing I learned is that, you know, how people treat each other is extremely important and really you know, if I'm in charge of something or at the head of something, I'm, I need to do a great job dictating what's expected and what's not. And I think you see that reflected in the discord community and the community on the show now in, in, uh, in particular, uh, next question is from Jason D'Ambrosia says, what's the toughest situation you've had to coach through? I think definitely early, you know, I don't want to get into too much detail or names or anything like that. But when I was a graduate assistant, I, a coach that I worked for was extremely very, very tough on me. And, you know, I would spend 16, 17 hours a day, you know, in the same building with this guy. And it was tough, definitely with the hardest situation of my life, you know, and it's one of these situations where someone's your superior and you got to do what they say. And you really, especially in a football environment, there's not a whole lot you know, you can do. In hindsight, I would definitely handle the situation a lot differently now being more mature, but I just kind of grinned and bear it. And it was extremely tough, but you know, it's, it's what I wanted to do. So I had to deal with it, but I learned how not to treat people based on that experience for sure. Uh, next question is from just Connor Nelson. So how do you make time for everything you do? Stream, real life, business, family, exercise, money. I feel like this is something that, you know, I'm always trying to get better at and the the way I make time for everything I do is I don't have a lot of leisure time. And so I've kind of really like uh, the time that I spend, the downtime that I spend is with my family as I don't really spend it, you know, hanging out with friends or watching TV or stuff like that. So I cut all that stuff out because everything else is more important to me, right? Like my family, business, community streaming youtube that's more important to me than watching a television show you know now of course do i still watch a show here then yeah i'll watch a series but i don't watch five or six or seven and my thing is there's nothing wrong with that you know if that's what makes you happy dude watch breaking bad dexter and game of thrones back to back to back but if you're not happy with whatever you have going on then that's the first place i would look and see what you can do to spend that time differently towards something you do want to do <laughs> This is from a pretty funny guy on Instagram it says, if you were to make the ultimate sandwich, how would I do it? It would definitely have chicken fingers, bacon, high quality bread, no mayo, thick onion, thick tomato. I think we just made it right there. I, I, just off the top of the dome, put that package and sell it. There you go. Next question is from L real Tristan on Instagram, I think he asked a question on Twitter as well. So how do you navigate sponsorship and ad revenue for your channel and podcast? So I go by a couple rules. Number one rule is that whatever I'm promoting or sponsoring or taking money for to, you know, sponsor something, if it's something that I don't like or wouldn't use, I don't take the deal. If something doesn't feel right, I don't take the deal. Um, and that's pretty much it. You know, I, I felt like I took a hard lesson not a, definitely i mean not a hard lesson but definitely a lesson publicly i did it took a twitch bounty sponsorship on a game i looked at for 30 seconds i go to start the bounty it was um something about cyanide and happiness i don't know what that is i get into it i'm like five minutes into it, i'm like yo this doesn't feel right and so i just flushed it and i apologized to the community i'm like this doesn't fit what we do it's kind of lewd you know, it wasn't anything over the top. It just didn't feel right. It wasn't something I would normally play. I'm not into that kind of humor. It, it wouldn't be something that I would think you can watch if your little brother's in the room. So I, I canned it. So those are some big things uh, for me. And in terms of, if it's not something I would, it would if, if it's not something I personally enjoy, I would never take the deal. Uh, uh, next question is, 
what's my favorite game to play and stream? Why? I have a bunch. You know, I really enjoy Tarkov. I really enjoy the Dark Souls series. I enjoy the Messenger. I enjoy Smash. I don't, any game, I, I'm starting to learn that games with less story and more chance for improv, making up lore, and stuff like that, elements of, you know, extreme you know consequence any games with that into them i'm really into them and and i, I don't know I, i'm into progression i'm into achievements i'm into aesthetics and and outfits and appearances in games i it's that's a really really tough question to answer all right and the last question is from hunter haddock on instagram and he says hey dan what's it like being a part of team unity and how has it changed your life i will say this you know being playing games with on a weekly basis with Melf, Austin, and Ryan. So Michael A. L. Fox, Last Gray Wolf, and Northern Lion. Over the past in March, it'll be two straight years. It's been a lot of fun, you know, and, and growing up in high school, you know, the, the closest thing I can relate to it is at a group of like s such a random group of friends in high school. But the bond that we had was Counter-Strike. You know, it was the mod. And these were friends that I probably wouldn't be friends with without that game. But we became friends in, in high school because of that game. We all ran in different circles. And I'd so, so I'd say that since then, I've never really had a group of friends that I play games with consistently. Really, ever. And so to have that with Team Unity and be, everyone's, everyone's so different in the group, you know everyone is, is so completely different but to know that every tuesday you get a chance to to play games with your buddies and and it's it's like an unspoken rule you know it just happens every tuesday that's what it is and that's what it's become so i think for me personally i just really enjoy it you know i enjoy that you know there's always something that's going to go wrong there's always going to be a little conflict and we're but we're always going to have fun with it and we've had some great moments we've had some hilarious moments we've had moments of disunity but end of the day, it's just it's it's a group of friends playing games every single Tuesday, Tuesday night on Twitch. And I really look forward to that. You know, and it's been crazy that the games that we've had fun with and crazy the games that, you know, just crazy things happen. You know, everything from PUBG to Farm Simulator to Minecraft. You, you just never know what you're going to get, you know, to the debacle in no man's sky it's just been there's ups and downs it but I, I wouldn't trade it for anything and, and it's definitely a highlight personally uh, for the week for me so with that being said this was the first ever q a only podcast where i don't i don't think this is going to become a regular thing you know it's not going to be an every week thing but i think it's something fun to do every now and then but I don't, at the end of the day, I don't drive that. You guys drive that. Let me know what you guys thought about this episode. Tweet me at Dan Giesling. Let me know if you like the Q&A episode. Send me a, a DM on Instagram, instagram.com slash Dan Giesling. Or, or join our community Discord at dangiesling.tv slash Discord. If, if you, you want to hang out with the community that I'm always talking about, that's a great place to do it. People are always playing games together. And, of course, we go live Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays on twitch.tv slash Dan Giesing. Thank you guys so much for listening to the special episode of the podcast. I will see you guys next Monday. I appreciate you guys tuning in, dialing in, and uh, have a great week. Later, guys.